when I took my first physics class, I was at community college, and I was just absolutely floored by the idea that we could describe the world with simple and elegant mathematical equations. It just amazed me. And so I cast aside my 17 magazines <laughs> in favor of reading books that were about theoretical physics. Now I'm an astrobiologist, and I study life. I'm interested in life here on Earth, and I'm also interested in life out there among the stars, if we can find it. And that's really cool, except the problem is we don't really understand what life is. And so I'm interested in whether we actually have a theory of life, if we could find a theory of life, and what its basis would be. And we're not there yet, but I think that we have some clues and there might actually be such a unified theory of life. And if there is, at its core, information has to be key. So in physics, we have lots of elegant theories. And a lot of the time nowadays, you're going to hear people talking about a theory of everything, something that unifies gravity with our theories of quantum physics. And so we have lots of theories of the quantum world, and we have gravity. If we put them together, we will explain everything. But there's a problem. The theory of everything is a theory of everything except those things that theorize. It explains nothing about us. And so for me, the thing that's most interesting about our theories of the world is that human beings, living, breathing entities, could write them down at all. So I drew this picture myself. Sometimes I like to be an artist. It wasn't with crayons. Um, but this is Newton's law of gravitation. So to be more perfectly accurate, I should have put the Einstein equation up here, but this one's more fun to play with. Um, so for me, this is beautiful. This is a work of art, but it's also beautiful because of the equation. That equation describes a lot about our world. It describes an apple falling from a tree and the motion of Earth around our sun. That unification is beautiful. We can predict those things with the same mathematical equation. It contains a lot of information. When we look up at our night sky, we see the stars, and we see motion among those stars, the planets. When Newton came up with his theory of gravitation, it was the first time that we could explain that. And not only could we explain it, but we could explain the reason I jump up and fall down with the same reason that we see a comet take a particular trajectory on our night sky. That is beautiful. Now, most people don't look at equations and think equations are beautiful. They'll look at something like this and think it's beautiful. And this is beautiful. This is the Mona Lisa, of course. And the Mona Lisa is one of the most famous paintings in the world. How much information is in that smile? How much does it make you feel? There's a ton of information in this painting. This is art. But why is this art? What makes this thing evoke such a response in us to feel something when we look at this image? I could take the same pixels on this painting, and I could randomize them. And suddenly, all that information is lost. It's not art. I could do that and make any, almost an infinite number of possible Mona Lisas just using those pixels of paint. But only some of them evoke that same response. Only some of them we would call art. So on this image I have here, on the right is information, on the left is entropy. And if we think about the space of all possible configurations of those pixels, only some of them are information. Only some of them mean something to us. We have a similar problem in physics. And being physicists, we can be somewhat dramatic. We think about the problem of what exists. I mean, most people don't think about physicists lying around, worrying about what exists, but we do. Um, but we do it in kind of a more precise way. We worry about why some mathematical equations correspond to the physical world and describe reality, and others don't. Why do some equations work and others don't? One possible resolution is to propose that all mathematical equations can correspond to something that exists somewhere. And this is the mathematical universe hypothesis first proposed by Max Hedmark. So the idea is everything that you can write down as an equation exists. But by trying to explain everything, you've effectively explained nothing. And if we think about art, I don't think anyone would buy that every possible arrangement of pixels on a canvas is art. There's something that separates art from things 
that don't evoke the same kind of response. So when we think about the question, what is art? Art is something that makes us feel something. It changes the way we think about the world. What is math to physics? Well, math to physics is the same way. Usually when we think about an equation like Newton's equation, we think the power and beauty of it is the ability to predict the world. But the true beauty and power of that equation, it's ability to change the world, to create things, to innovate. And here's just one example of what our knowledge of the laws of gravitation have done. We are the only planet in the solar system with a halo of artificial satellites. We are the only planet that is anti-accreting. We are throwing stuff into space. That is a creative process. Earth without a technological civilization has no satellites. Earth with it has satellites. The dividing line is that Earth has systems that generate information and use information to create new possibilities. Information changes the world. And if you don't believe me, you've probably been living under a rock because we live in the information age. I am sure everyone listening to this talk has a cell phone or a device nearby. And for those of you in the room tonight, you are probably gonna check that device when you leave here. You are gonna check your email, you're gonna get a text from a friend. That is gonna change or help decide what you do after. It changes you. You are impacted by information every day. So when we get to the question that I'm absolutely obsessed about, what is life? This is the key story, information. Information is the thing that living systems are doing that no other physical system that we know about is even coming close to doing. Um, so the question, what is life, has been a question that physicists have been asking for a long time since Erwin Schrodinger first posed the question to physicists in a particular way that made it a question for physics in 1944. And we're not there yet, but we're getting closer. And so as an astrobiologist, I care what separates a non-living world from a living world. And our living world is distinct because of all the information processing systems on its surface. And you may say, well, Sarah, so far, you've been talking about technological civilizations. Surely that's an extreme example. That's not really what life is. That's an example of life. And so just to relate it back to biology, I'm gonna give one more example, which is the example of a slime mold. And so what I have here is a picture of Tokyo and a picture of a slime mold. <laughs> they look remarkably similar. Um, and that's actually not by coinc uh, coincidence. It's actually by the algorithms that these systems came up with to solve the same problem. And so when Tokyo was planned as a city, the engineers had to develop a subway. And the subway stations were in particular locations, and the city got designed around where those locations were. People want to be near subways. The slime mold, those little dots, they're food sources and they were arranged in the same manner as the subway stations in Tokyo. And both systems came up with a similar plan for the solution. They came up with a similar algorithm, a similar informational solution to the problem at hand. This is ubiquitous in biology. And so when most people think about explanatory frameworks for thinking about life and understanding life, they think about evolution, they think about Darwin's theories. And I just wanna make a last point that information is absolutely critical to understanding why Darwin works at all. And so to illustrate that, I'm gonna do a little experiment. Um, this was actually an experiment done in the lab. It's called the Spiegelman's Monster, after the scientist Spiegelman that performed the experiment. And he took a virus, and he put it in a test tube, and selected it on it. So he did Darwinian evolution, select for this thing to be able to copy itself, and did that iteratively. The thing that he got out was not a more complex system a more complex virus. It was a very simple one. Why was it simple? It was evolving. It should be getting more interesting over time. Well, the reason it was more simple is because in real living systems, they're open. They're getting information constantly from their environment. They're getting information from each other. In the test tube, it was a closed system. There was no information being input to that system. And when we think about the way we're designing experiments for origins of life in the lab, we're always studying closed systems. They're in a test tube. This may be one reason that we haven't solved the origin of life yet. We need the information input into the system. And so when I'm thinking about living systems, this information aspect is absolutely critical. And so on the bottom here is shown 
DNA. Right. On the one side, we see things that are random. On the other side, we see things that are information. We think about DNA, our genome. It contains information. Right? It's the information that we pass on to our children. But the information there is also critically important to performing transformations in the cell. It's actually what tells our cell how to work. It's the same kind of way that some mathematical equations or some pieces of art are information. They do something to the world. They create things. They innovate. And so the very essence of what living systems are, what they do, is informational in nature. They use information to create new possibilities and to innovate. And that is the story of life.